Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is episode 30. And to be honest, I've struggled with titling this episode because there are so many colorful and playful sides to my guest. My guest is Norm Hiscock, and Norm and I met on the TV show Brooklyn Nine-Nine, where I was a camera assistant and Norm was consulting producer and writer. Norm and I bonded over the minutia of us both driving Honda Fits and the fact that I went to film school in Vancouver, British Columbia. Norm happens to be from Canada, grew up in Montreal, and I happen to be obsessed with Canadians. So, one morning on the set of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the crew was setting up as we often do, and I noticed Norm walking around set with a gentleman. And that gentleman happened to be Dave Foley. And for those of you who are fans of Kids in the Hall, yes, it was the Dave Foley. And I don't usually get starstruck, but I got a little starstruck because this was Dave Foley. This man made me laugh so much through my adolescence. So I slightly geeked out and then later went up to Norm and said, so um, Dave Foley was with you on set. What was that about? And he said, oh, Dave's my friend. I used to write for kids in the hall. And you guys, this is what I'm talking about. If I may just have a moment of self-indulgence, I am consistently around people of high caliber and I don't even know it. They're like circling around me. People who have years of experience in the comedy world and they're hiding it beneath their modesty. And Norm is definitely one of these people. Norm began his comedy career writing for Kids in the Hall. He then wrote for Saturday Night Live. He went on to write for King of the Hill, Parks and Recreation, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He is currently executive producer on hit TBS comedy, sci-fi drama, People of Earth. You will quickly find out Norm is kind and gracious. He's open to possibility and will meet you right where you're at. And we'll talk with you about whatever you want to talk about. He's interested and he's interesting. I think you'll love him. A few notes I should give you though, because it's not clarified in this episode. We talk about two talented individuals who have not single-handedly, but handedly, helped to shape our current comedic ecosystem. The first is Greg Daniels and the second is Dan Gore. And what you need to know is that Greg Daniels has created and written a plethora of shows. The Simpsons, King of the Hill, The Office, Parks and Recreation, and now People of Earth. And Dan Gore is the writer and creator of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Okay, I think that's it. Here is my interview with Norm. Norm. Yeah. (laughs) Is this your first podcast? This is my first, I think. Really? Yes, I've listened to them before, but I've never done one. Well, I feel so honored that you... You got a virgin podcast guy. Yeah. (laughs) But I feel like this is the first of many, probably, for I you. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I like listening to them. They're a lot of fun to listen to. Which ones do you listen to, I like by the, the way? Mark, Mark Maron because he has the, uh, talks to a lot of comedians, and there's something about uh, that he does where he gets stuff out of them, that, or they're willing to talk to him, which I think is kind of neat. I feel say. like he's the most present interviewer yeah. today. Yeah. Like, I feel like his mind, when he sits down with his guests, his mind is totally focused on that person. Yeah. And his follow-up questions are like everything that I would want to ask. Usually. Yeah. And he's, he does not afraid to sort of chase, because he says he does it in the stand-up, so he chases ideas and themes that uh, and stuff about their personal lives that he's not afraid to explore. Mm-hmm. But somehow he gets them to relax and talk about, you mm-hmm. know. And I always like to see the stuff behind the the comedy too right so it's i think that's uh, there's that tv show what was it uh, on cnn the comedians or and that's sort of just an extension i think of, of what mark Marin was doing anyway you know when you're talking with a comedian or any sort of creative person do you feel like it's rude to ask about their process uh no i don't think so i mean um like just uh, saying uh working with wyatt on the show i asked i asked him about what his process was in terms of putting together a stand-up show and how he does it and he he wanted to talk about it i mean oh they, really yeah they like to talk to other people who are in comedy and what they do everybody's approach is slightly different so i like to find out about it mm-hmm. and he's sort of a bit of a storyteller and he the way he's 
said it he just works slowly on his uh his process is is very slow where he'll try out material and then keep that a certain part of the material then rework other material and then try that out and then work it until it uh, is like a whole show and he feels good about it so mm-hmm. i like finding out about that stuff and how they do it especially a stand-up because mm-hmm. i don't do it so yeah yeah uh, so you're and, interested yeah. in how they how they pump the iron kind yeah of thing. yeah um I was thinking about this. So you've written for a lot of different shows, but what was your original plan? Oh, I had no original plan. Okay. So I was, uh, I knew I wanted to do something in creative. I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And I remember I grew up in Montreal. And uh, do you remember when you were in school, you would fill out these forms as to vocational forms, that, you know, and the, on all, every form, they always had things like lawyer or doctor. And so I went, well, n- nothing on these forms represents me. And so I couldn't figure out, like, oh, and that's not me. But yeah. I knew, and I liked, all, the friends that I liked were funny. And Sean Keen was, he was the first guy I ever knew. He was wanted to be a stand-up comic. And he was in high school. And he was going to quit. He quit high school to become a stand-up. Wow. And I thought that was pretty amazing. And he would sit down and write jokes. And uh, I learned a lot of comedy from him. And another guy, Dwight Hood, this other guy I grew up with in high school, they love Steve Martin, and and I love Steve Martin. So mm-hmm. it was just finding a group of people that you could share, you know, that with. And did then, you grow up watching SNL? I did. Uh, I grew up in so I grew up in Montreal. So we watched a lot of British comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Monty Python was huge for me, and then the other one was uh, SCTV was mm. the other one, which is a Canadian show I was shot in Edmonton and John Candy I was a big fan of John Candy so Mm -hmm. I uh, grew up watching those guys so um, going back to just you being in high school and you said your friend Sean yes Sean yeah and then Dwight Dwight yes so these guys were writing jokes well uh, Dwight was just a fan of comedy and he uh, he was he came from uh, his dad was uh, a professor and wrote books so, like, I was always interested in families that were a very artistic mm-hmm. because it was so the opposite of my family. Hmm. Uh, and Dwight's family, he had his brother um, paints, his sister's a painter and a writer. His dad was a professor and wrote books. So I found that really fascinating. Mm-hmm. He could play music. He was a musician, and he, he could write funny jokes. And then I thought, well, yeah, I want to be around that. Mm-hmm. What was it like in your house? Like, what were your parents Very like? blue collar. My dad was, because he keep, became from a fishing village, he didn't want to be a, f- a fisherman's son. He didn't want to fish for a, a living. So he moved to Montreal, and he put himself through school and became an engineer. And so he was, it was a very sort of um, a job that he really loved, but also a practical job. He liked st- stuff that was practical. So when I went, said, I want to be, you know, I want to be a, cameraman or he didn't know what that meant yeah and yeah. uh he didn't know if i could make a living doing it and mm-hmm. it didn't seem very practical to him mm-hmm. so he well, i remember he was putting me he said i'll pay for your education if you um take business and i went all right so i took business but uh, halfway through the semester i went i don't want to do this mm-hmm. halfway so, through the semester yes yeah, so i was like no and it was then, that quick. Yeah. You were like, okay. No, I don't want to do this. And so yeah. he, I said, uh, I just sort of dropped out and he was angry. And I said, look, he said, I'm not paying for your education anymore. And I said, fine, I'll do, pay for my own education. Mm-hmm. And I just worked and saved up money and then sort of tried to figure out where I was going to go to school and what I would do. Mm-hmm. And I ended up in Calgary um, uh, taking a film course, documentary filmmaking. Wow. Now... Your dad, what kind of an engineer was he? He was uh, was an electrical engineer, and then but he moved over into heating, and then he became an environmental engineer. So, oh. uh, yeah, um, and he we moved back to Newfoundland. Um, he was working on a project there, and I think he wanted to come home and say, "Look, I made it. I've got a job," and and we spent two years there, wow. and so uh, that was kind of fun to see where he grew up. And to meet all the people in the town, because it was a small town, it's three thousand people, and most of the people in the town, I found out I was um, <laughs> related to. Oh, really? Yeah, everybody <laughs> you met on the street had you were like the distant cousin of somebody. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was kind of wild. A whole entire town. Yeah. is my yeah. relation. Yeah, that's- <laughs> 
was, it was crazy. A whole town yeah. in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you had told me one time that, because um, you, you have beautiful photography. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but uh, was it your grandfather who also did photography or was there somebody, you were, you were saying something about, was there something with seals? Seals? Did I make this up? You might have. <laughs> did I just like combine your fishing relatives with Nanook of the North? I might have <laughs> just done that. I don't know if anybody else had a visual thing. In the, I just love photography. I just think in terms of pictures. Yeah. That's how I see things. Yeah. Even when I write, I have to, I kind of see the person in the room mm-hmm. before I hear the dialogue. Hmm. Um, and I kind of get a picture of where they are and how they move within the world. So I just like pictures and I I just found too, maybe you found this too, like just in terms of framing, you just have a knack for it or you don't, you just frame a picture nicely. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I I just, I had an eye for it. And I like lighting too, lighting, you know, is yeah. everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you really do see yeah. light. I mean, your photos on Instagram are gorgeous. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm always very fascinated. And your, your background is so interesting, Norm, because... It is like you come from a very technical background, then going into camera and then yeah. coming through that. That's so that's very technical and creative. But yeah, I thought maybe I wanted to be a cameraman and um, get into lighting, and then I did improvising. I tried improvising. I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. That was in Calgary, and Mark was there. Mark McKinney, and um, who was now was in the kids in the hall and so i just thought i'd try it and i mark and i went down one time to loose moose theater the just improv group in calgary and then they invite people up on stage and they needed someone for a scene and i went down on stage and it was very terrible <laughs> and didn't face the audience but got a couple of laughs and then i thought oh i like doing this so mark and i started a team just a two man team okay and then uh, started performing you could do that in the old days of just going up and learning and failing uh, and so i like that there were and then there, they also um, keith johnstone who started it his uh british and uh a big uh, improv guru mm-hmm. um would teach classes so i got to hmm. learn from him and how to improvise and so that that was all at loose moose theater yes and was improv was that just beginning then or what had it been going on for it'd been a while? going on for a while i mean second city you've been around for a long time okay and that was sort of the the i think the big thing that you follow in the groundlings too you knew about the groundlings because mm-hmm. of um when saturday Night live started it was all the people that i watched on that show i went oh where did they come from and i found out oh they came from the groundlings oh they're from mm-hmm. second city like dan Aykroyd was a canadian and was in second city and john candy second city so mm-hmm. all those guys uh, was that just in chicago at the time or was there a no there was city one in... in toronto okay yeah there was an offshoot and they brought people down from chicago to be in it like joe flaherty mm-hmm. and i think um gilda radner i think hmm so you guys, I love that you said you went up on stage, but you didn't face the audience. Yeah, I didn't face I didn't know what, uh, the, yeah, the, I mean, Keith Johnston said, no, you were good. And, and we wanted to see your expressions and <laughs> what your face was doing. And he said, so you have to just, you know, it's theater. So you have to turn to face people. I was just treating it like, you know, being in somebody's house. Or yeah, whatever. you were yeah, just, yeah, you yeah. were in your playing space. <laughs> That's right. And you were talking to the person. Yes. who was there That's right. i didn't know <laughs> enough to face the audience so it was kind of fun to, and then you just learn that stuff all the time too and then you learn all the things that in the classes were space work and and just you know how to mime and how to lift things and give things weight when you're lifting stuff and like when you're picking up something that's invisible it should have weight mm-hmm. and a shape to it so mm-hmm. you just and when you're on stage you shouldn't think about it too much you just grab it and then that's the weight and that's the the shape that it is. Mm-hmm. Don't overthink what it is. So, and you said that you formed a two-man show with. Well, Mark. it was a two-man team. Mark and I. We called. We were called the refugees, and then um, uh, we saw other people within the loose moose that we wanted to start. Or sorry, can you join our group? And we formed a bigger group called the Audience, and that was um, uh, Mark Bruce McCullough, who's also in Kids in the Hall, myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary Campbell, this guy who's a writer now, and uh, Frank Van Keeken, who was a writer. So there was five of us. Wow. And we were doing that for a while. And then we were getting bored 
doing improv a little bit, we thought, should we write our own stuff? And so they had a, an hour on Saturday night, night that they didn't know what to do with. And so it was an hour and a half, actually. And so mm. we just filled it with comedy and we sort of improvised um, ideas. Uh, and that's how we sort of learned to write. You know, mm-hmm. we perform it on stage, and well, that worked, and that didn't work, and we would shape it as we went along and change it. And Bruce would do stand up. There would be like a ten minute spot for Bruce to do stand up, and so it was almost like a variety show. That's so cool. Yeah, and it was started selling out. That was the thing that surprised us: is that we were just doing it to screw around. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the year, that's when Mark and Bruce said, "Well, should we do this for a living?" And I was still in film school and had to finish my course. So I didn't go with them to Toronto and stayed Mm -hmm. in Calgary. And I got married there. Oh. Yeah. But uh, finished the course and then eventually ended up in Toronto. But I worked for three years in TV, shooting Mm -hmm. news. Mm Mm-hmm. Wait, so, okay. When you were in Calgary, that was um, prior to you doing camera work. Yes. that was. You were in film school. I was in film school doing improv doing both those things, so writing shows and doing the improv thing and also going to school and shooting films and cutting them and doing all that stuff. Was that also where you had taken the business class or was that no, a that totally was in, different? No, that was in uh, Newfoundland. Okay, that was in Newfoundland. And yeah. then how did you decide to go to Calgary? Like, what? Well, my dad got a job in Calgary and then I knew Mark was in Calgary and I thought, okay, I'll move there because I, I guess I could have stayed in Newfoundland and got an arts degree or something and paid for that. But I thought, no, I want to do um, film or TV. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted. So you actually met Mark in Newfoundland. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we did a radio show uh, of writing really bad sketches because I, I was a <laughs> DJ for a while. Uh, I thought maybe I want to do that and I'll spin records. And and then Mark and I uh, got together and wrote really bad comedy sketches and did um, bad comedy sketches on the radio. And That's we so thought fun. that was fun. And I yeah. thought when I went there, I'd hook up with him again and see if we wanted to write comedy or do something like that again. Was that fun being a DJ? It was fun. I was, I guess I, I should have chatted more. I just like, I was always <laughs> the guy that thought uh, people just want to hear the music. So I, yeah. I would just not chat as much. But And would you have to plan your sets like yeah, way I, in yes. advance? Yeah, yeah. That was records back then, right? So mm-hmm. I went in and, and just took all the records and put them in alphabetical order. And and uh, I would see each album and go, what's this album? And I put it aside and, and then it was just me listening to albums and learning about each band. And that's how I got to know a lot about music. It was just seeing all the albums and, and then saying, I've never heard this and just playing it and mm-hmm. sitting there hours just listening to music and learning about music. Could you play whatever you wanted? Yes, that was the greatest thing. Okay. Yeah, and it was during the punk movement too, so I got to uh, play a lot of... Would you go in sometimes and just be like, I'm feeling this way, so we're going to listen to all this? Well, during uh, during the lunch hour, I would do... Because sometimes that was the the lunch hour on, on the radio station. I would then change my lineup of songs. So I wouldn't just play the kind of songs I wouldn't want to listen to all the time. I play what people I think would want to listen to over lunch. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, I got to do anything I wanted if you didn't play what I wanted. That's what I liked about it. But then I found out if you went into radio, of course, you don't do that, right? They tell you what to play most of the time. And back then in Montreal, I remember listening to FM radio stations and they would play uh, Street Hassle by Lou Reed and play the whole album. And I thought that's what you could do. Yeah. But that course, was just he, special. That's right. Oh, my <laughs> yeah, yeah, gosh. So one time, Norm, I worked on a movie in Detroit. And um, on the weekends, I would just drive around in my car because I didn't really know what to do with my, my downtime. I was right. like, I don't know. So I was just driving around, and I could pick up these French stations, these French-Canadian right. stations. I, I, was, I didn't know where it was coming. I mean, I just thought, okay, well, maybe it's coming from Toronto. Right. But um, I learned about some different singer-songwriters through that station that now I'm, I listen to, and I don't know anybody else who listens to them. Right. Um, this guy, uh, Jerome, Jerome Minier. No, I never heard of him. I think he's out of Montreal. Oh, really? Yeah, but I was thinking, oh, Montreal is so friendly to the arts. You know, maybe this wow. is why the station is like this. And, and, well, Canada in general, I feel like, is 
so supportive of arts in general. So. I think Quebec does a really good job of, of doing that. And I kind of love uh, Newfoundland's like that too. They protect their culture a little bit and they hmm. celebrate and they have no problem making a film. Everybody goes out to see the films and support them so they always make their money back. Hmm. There's never like a worry, will this bomb or not? It's just a real healthy support of just seeing a film that was made in their province, you know? Mm-hmm. Why do you think it's like that in Canada? Like, how do you, how did it get to be so supportive? I don't know. I I, I think because I think especially in in Montreal or Quebec, it's unique, right? So it's a unique culture, mm-hmm. and I think they celebrate it. And everything's done through the uh, there's grants, right? There's not a lot of money. That's why I don't think there's you don't see a lot of sitcoms coming out of Canada, or there's not a lot of money poured into that kind of thing it's more Mm -hmm. of a a cultural thing Hmm. so you get grants to do things that sort of support that idea Mm -hmm. I remember I went to this is before I went to film school in Vancouver I went I I had a friend who um, had a short film at that time I think it was called the Worldwide Short Film Festival in Toronto right and um, it was actually do you know um this guy, his name's Aaron Yonda, and he was part of. Um, did you ever hear of Chad Vader? Oh, uh, Chad on Vader. YouTube. Chad yeah. Vader, and they they do uh, beer and board games, and no, they have these different little shows on YouTube and stuff. But anyway, my yeah, my friend Aaron Yonda, he had this short film in the Worldwide Short Film Festival, and I went with him, and um, there was a huge panel with the. Uh, art supporter in Canada. It was like the National Board. Oh, yeah. Was the, the, Canadian... Uh, the National Film Board, NFB? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The National Film Board. Yeah, I remember growing up watching all the... A lot of it was sort of weird animation and experimental stuff. And, and the, yeah, all grant money, too. Uh, Those guys were yeah. amazing, though. Yeah, I know. Like, sitting in on that panel, I felt just... I mean, I wasn't... I didn't even have a film there. You know, I was just there to support a friend. But I felt very supported as an artist oh, that's showing cool. up there. Yeah. And I thought, man, if I lived here, um, I could get like any film idea I had, I could get it realized. That was the environment in that right. room. It was like, did they have to submit uh, like their idea, the short film? And do you know the process? Because I think that's what you have to do or I'm not sure if you, yeah, there yeah. it was like you had to submit, but they made it, feel like you were so welcome like they welcomed artists to submit and then also um like there was nothing pretentious about them right there it didn't feel competitive it felt like no you are welcome to submit your creative ideas and we will meet with you and talk with you about that and how to make it happen right i was like wow this is amazing (laughs) because i don't know something that exists like that here no i mean you that you can probably find pockets of communities that sort of do that but really yeah no, it's a yeah, profit-making yeah. thing. You have it has to make its money back, or it's hard. Although it's yeah. probably better now, right? A little bit. It's just that everything's done so cheaply. Like you can get your series if you can sell a series mm-hmm. and do ten, but you have to do it for very cheap. It's sort of like uh, Louis C.K. had to do his series, and they said we'll give you this amount of money, and uh, and then he said okay, no notes, but he did it for a certain amount of cash. Hmm. Um, so then you start thinking about how you shoot your show and how you approach it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then how you spend your money, right? Mm-hmm. So your time's efficient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to when you were in Calgary. Yes. Because I want to get, I'm going to get yeah. to what we were just talking right. about a little bit later. But when you were in Calgary and you decided to go into camera work, how long after, because you were, you were improvising and you guys had your team and then after that, um, Mark moved to Toronto. Yeah, with, you guys with decided- Bruce. And then he asked me, they said, do you want to go? And I said, well, I'm getting married. I'm still um, finishing my... Because uh, I did two years of film and then one more year of television. Mm-hmm. Um, and back then, docu- although I liked the idea of shooting documentaries, there wasn't really a form. You couldn't really make a lot of money shooting documentaries. So I thought, well, I'll work in TV and I'll shoot news or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, but now you can make a documentary. People want to see them. And yeah. there, there's a world out there where... <laughs> yeah, people are obsessed yeah, yeah. with documentaries. I love yeah. them. Yeah, so that's I stayed there and they moved. And then I uh, I moved to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, a prairie town, and worked in wow. a very tiny TV station shooting news there. And then we spent a year there, Cindy and I, and then we moved to um, 
Toronto. Mm -hmm. So that's where the guys were in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then... um, uh, And you were still doing camera work I was. I worked at a multicultural station shooting news. And so that's why we traveled across Canada with Queen Beatrix. So there was a show, a Dutch show. And I worked on a... There was an Italian show I worked on. And then there was... a Chinese show it's like they had different shows on the station that for each community and yeah and so I thought that was kind of cool and that's amazing yeah. <laughs> and I said I did that for two years and then uh, I auditioned for this what was supposed to be a touring company like a new second city touring uh, company and I was still performing and um, and I did it and they uh, was supposed to run all summer in Ottawa and then tour Canada but we closed down after four weeks oh. and we got closed and so i was out of work and then uh, luckily the kids in the hall show got picked up and i ended up writing on that show oh my gosh talk about timing i know yeah so when you moved to well first of all what made you want to go into camera work well you know uh i was in newfoundland and um my uh, there was a guy there another guy who's artistic and i met at the radio station Ken Harvey, who writes books Hmm. and poetry. And I thought, well, and his dad owned um, a film company where he shot industrial films. Mm -hmm. And on the weekends, he would take us out and and just show us how to load a camera, film camera. And then uh, he taught us a little bit about framing. Hmm. And he said, yeah, you're framing that upright or you're not framing that right. And talked about lenses. And when we watch films, he would say, oh, that's a... Watch, they're pushing in on some water right now, and I bet you they're gonna, it's a transitional shot, and they're going go mm. to go to the uh, ocean or something, and then you go, oh, he, he did cut to that. So he was a guy that just informed me on how, the language of film. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, well, maybe that's something. Mm-hmm. And he was very giving. He would, uh, you know, it was like a guy who said, yeah, I'll take you out and show you how to shoot. So I thought, oh, maybe that's the thing I want to do. You know, it's, it's interesting that you were brought on as a writer, Yes. To kids in the hall. Yeah. So it's cool that that door was still open to you, even though it's like you didn't go right away. Yeah, I didn't sit down and write anything. I mean, I still performed. It was just because I knew them and they wanted to hire friends. And also my wife. When we first moved to Toronto, we were out of work. And so we were working in production houses, commercial production houses. And I was a PA. And she worked her way up to becoming a producer of commercials. And then when the Kids in the Hall started, uh, they were looking for a producer to do the films. And so they hired Cindy to produce them. And then so she was working the first season on Kids in the Hall. And, mm-hmm. I, and they ran out of material after their first season. They didn't have any more material left. Mm-hmm. And so they were looking for writers. And I said, sure, yeah, I want to do it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I'd never, other than performing sketches and coming up with ideas and then performing them on stage, I never actually sat down and wrote anything. Hmm. But once I started doing it, I went, oh, I can do it. And uh, I loved working with different minds in the group, too. It was like Mark McKinney did very, like, character work and would think about that. And Bruce liked premises and would be more out there in terms of what his ideas were. And Kevin and Dave were more comedy guys, you know, and loved comedy and the history of comedy. So um, I would take each idea that I had and, like, go, this is more of a Mark thing. This is more of a Bruce thing. This is more of a Dave and Kevin thing. Mm -hmm. And that helped sharpen my skills. I would just learn to write different ways, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that became part of my toolbox, right? So Kids in the Hall, because Kids in the Hall was formed in Toronto, is that? Yeah, I mean, part part of them, the two of them were in Calgary and moved to Toronto. And then the other part of Kids in the Hall, like those, Kevin um, and Dave joined up with them in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And they were in Second City. They took Second City. Okay. And then Scott Thompson ended up joining them. And he was Second City, too, for a while as well. And then just they formed that group. So when you moved to Toronto, they were like, the group was already ex- existing. They were already existing, And then they were yeah. like... And they were at the Rivoli and they had a really hot show and being talked about. And then okay. they had also been sent down to New York to shoot a pilot. And then they shot the pilot for HBO and then it got picked up. But I wasn't there for the first season. Cindy was. She worked on it. But then... The, so wild. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then the next season I joined and... Um, and then I worked my way up and became head writer in the last two years. And I shot a lot of the Super 8 on the show, like the bumpers in between. I shot those. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah. No one else seemed interested in doing this. But uh, for me, it was the, all the stuff I had learned. Yeah. You know, you get all the sketches, you shoot them first, and then you just have sketches up on a wall. Hmm. And then you have to put them. It's like a playlist for me. It was like doing songs. So this song would go into that song. Mm-hmm. And so I just would start with a sketch and say, what well, would how would it go into the next thing? 
And so I think uh, I did that for four years on the show too, just putting the shows together. The editing of it? Yes. Yeah, like, so, yeah, okay, we this, just filmed yeah, this yeah, sketch. This yeah, sketch is going to go here yeah. and this will flow into this yeah. one. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. How would you like... Uh, we figured out a formula. It took me, because no one else wanted to do, and I was just putting stuff together, and I was doing it with themes at first. Mm-hmm. I thought themes might be good. Mm-hmm. But really what it ended up being was just trying, because everybody loved different people in the troupe. Mm-hmm. So I would make sure that everybody had a piece in the show. Okay. And that uh, all, most of the episodes would end with a five-man piece. So you would open with someone, and you just make sure if someone was light in this episode, the next episode they would be have a little bit more to do and Mm -hmm. and you because there were monologues and then sketches so you would have to make sure that it wasn't all monologues and Mm -hmm. it was just maybe one monologue in the show i think that's really interesting that you said um you didn't know what you were doing like that you guys had not written down anything you guys had just tried things out and if they went over well then you're like okay this is working or if it didn't this isn't working Yeah, i'm not doing that again (laughs) yeah like trial and error yeah and I mean, that's got to be a little bit strange to transfer from, you know, playing something out in an open space to putting it on a two-dimensional yes. sheet of paper. Yeah. And I think quickly we learned, like Cindy did this thing when she she brought in um, uh, people who just got out of film school. So mm-hmm. we didn't hire known directors. We hired hungry directors who mm-hmm. wanted to show off a bit and actually uh, do a good job. So... Uh, and then we, she would bring them in and talk to the kids in the hall, and then they would say, yeah, we like that guy, and then work with those people. And then hmm. people who they liked would stay, and other people would go. Mm-hmm. But um, it was always opening the door to make sure that other new people, new talent could try stuff on a, this weird show hmm. and still uh, help the tone of the show. Because the, the kids have a very unique voice the kids in the hall right so mm-hmm. and each right, one yeah. in, the, in the group did too mm-hmm. that's what i liked about the show i had real personality mm-hmm. you know you felt like you knew them mm-hmm. that's what i liked about it yeah it's like they would they did monologues where they would talk about stuff and then a lot of their stuff was real life things or and they were clever too but <clears throat> you had a sense that you knew them like kevin would when he talked about stuff it was based some of it was based on kevin's life and bruce mccullough too and then and Scott as well, right? So uh, had a lot of personality of the show. Mm-hmm. Did you, because you said you were also still performing at the time. And then yeah, how did was, you decide yeah. to um, just concentrate on writing? I was doing auditions for co- TV commercials and like doing the whole route of trying to think of, about performing. And then I, after a while, I thought, no, I don't want to do it. I did it when it was fun. Mm-hmm. I did a couple of walk on stuff on the show but I, it became not so much fun and i would yeah i worried too much it was more like homework for me than fun so okay like, yeah, yeah. Huh. like learning lines that yeah. just felt like homework yeah <laughs> yeah it's good to have those defining moments yeah to you know be able to say i really like this but i'm not so passionate about it yeah like it's not driving me to it's not exciting me to do it right for me, it's, it's, I like writing is hard enough anyway mm-hmm. uh, that I just didn't want to. And then I really didn't enjoy the process of sit, going down to an audition, sitting in the room, waiting to be called on, going in there. And I never got past the uh, the idea of being nervous about it. I guess there always be nerves when you're acting, but I feel like most actors really love acting. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really love acting. I, I appreciated it, and I'm glad I did it so that when I write, I use that, and I yeah. know that someone's out on the stage, and I better write something good for them. Yeah. So that was good that I did it, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to keep pursuing it. When you were writing at that time, I mean, d- like, how did you think of sketches? Are, are a lot of sketches, um, like, nuanced things that you see in everyday life that yeah. you're like, oh, my gosh, that would be so weird if this or what if this? The Kids in the Hall show taught me to be more... It was like, I think it just was observational. So Mm -hmm. um, if you look at their stuff, it's about work and families, Mm -hmm. relationships. So I think it was always based on real life stuff. That's where it started for me anyway. Uh, If you look at SCTV, it's more about parody of TV, that TV show. And I think they kind of define themselves uh, by what was already on television. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to do... Um, Saturday Night Live, they didn't want to do parodies, they didn't want to do talk shows. SCTV sort of did a take on 
showbiz and they didn't want to do that. So it was all very real stuff. It was mm-hmm. about, you know, just being a teenager or being in a family or, you know, being married or, you know, work situations. And yeah. so uh, you just would, I, all that stuff would creep in. And um, I liked it. I mean, I had meat to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Norm, there is a sketch that I was like searching the web for, but I couldn't find it. But it's this one, it's Scott, and it's like his hundredth, um, sketch as a waiter. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it was so. I can't remember funny. who wrote that. I'm trying to remember now. I wonder if it was Dave and Scott. Well, but yeah, it was just so ridiculous because yeah, yeah, so it like yeah. starts off as him being a waiter, and then all of a sudden they just everyone comes out and celebrates <laughs> yeah. the fact that this is his hundredth sketch as a waiter. Yeah. And then we actually it was because we <laughs> made fun of it in a way, because if you look at the Scott played a lot of waiters. And when, when we look back, we went, we, we did a montage of all the waiters he played in different scenes. And then they made him wait on them yeah, afterwards. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's great. laughs> at the time, I was like, has he really played that many? Waiters? Yeah, he did. And then I'm like, yeah, he has That's a lot of scenes, with these <laughs> a lot of food scenes, you know? And I, this past week, I was rewatching some because I haven't seen it in a while. And I saw like a sketch I hadn't seen ever was the women sketch. It's like a W O. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're all playing poker. Yes, yeah, it's great. That's from the first season. They did great group sketches like that too, where they just sit around and then just muse on a theme. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I like that because yeah. these are like things that. These are the types of conversations that I would actually enjoy having right. with somebody. Yeah. Like the the one scene where it's like there's a plate and uh, Scott Thompson is is the head chef. Yes. And he has put dessert on this plate. Oh, that's and right. There's yeah. like dipping sauce. Yeah, that's right. The dipping areas. Yeah. The, the dipping areas. Yeah, and they're yeah. trying to figure out, well, how will we serve this yes. without putting a thumbprint <laughs> in right. it? And I first of all, I never see guys stand around and talk about things you know talk like 360 degrees around an issue yeah, yeah. but um <laughs> I know. but I'll, I, yeah. also i like the minutiae of yeah i like types that of too i like how small some of the stuff was that's the kind of observational stuff that i think the show did really well and then it's just hanging around uh like what i would hang around kevin and go to see his behavior and mm-hmm. go that's a sketch and he would go yeah and we would end up writing a sketch he wrote a he would have a to-do list, mm-hmm. things to do, and then uh, I thought, well, that's a sketch. Just it's like you, it's a guy who, because he's very obsessive. It's just a guy <laughs> going through his day, trying to do his list of things to do. Yeah. And then uh, being, uh, we said, if he's going to the bank and then he gets kidnapped by bank robbers, and then it throws him off his list. <laughs> but then he's determined, to, despite the fact that he's been kidnapped, he's going to do his list. Like yeah. it's not going to stop him from doing his list. So. It was just like, you know, heightening those little things, those mm-hmm. observational things. So how did, like, working on the show and, like, transitioning into full-time writing, how did that change the way that you, your perspective on, like, life or the way that you observe things? It or didn't did really it? change anything. It just made me, uh, I like, um, I guess, the, the, all, like, if you were on, I was on vacation and I remember growing out a beard and thinking, <laughs> oh... Uh, what if I kept my beard uh, and just kept, you know, after vacation, didn't shave it off? Because normally I would shave off my beard after the vacation. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, that'd be interesting if, <laughs> if the beard changed that person. He became more of a jerk and he be, fell in love with his beard hmm. and it kind of ruined his relationship. Uh, and we played it more like a horror movie and then we sort of f- found a genre for it. Mm-hmm. So it's just like little things like that where you would write down little things and then you write them down and then you go is that a thing (laughs) yeah and then when you uh, the great thing about working on a show with other people is that you go i have this idea and i would normally have a line or two and you could hear the premise Mm -hmm. and then they would go oh that's great well how what if you do this or what if you do that or why are you doing it like that shouldn't you be doing it like this and you go oh yeah why was i doing it like that because you get stuck on how Mm -hmm. you think it should be Yeah. And then someone's going, no, you've got too much going on. Just spoil it down to this. And you go, oh, yeah, it's much better. Yeah, you just skimmed all of it. Oh, thank God. Thank you for doing that. (laughs) I remember I was this, I had a transition in a scene. I remember telling Bruce uh, going, and so you cut back to the bar and they're just sort of talking. He said, why cut back to the bar? Just cut to the next thing. 
and do it hmm. visually and do it in slow motion or something. And I went, oh, yeah, why would I? Yeah. So it just gets you thinking in terms of uh, pictures and uh, visual language that, you know, sort of like the playwriting idea, like c- because we came from the stage at the first Mm-hmm. In the first place, right. that's what you applied. Mm-hmm. And you go, no, 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 don't do that. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, yeah, why, why would I do that? Oh, that makes <laughs> yeah, sense, yeah, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because you're right, because film is a, is a visual yeah. format or medium. Yeah. And so, yeah, you have to, like, kind of transfer or tr- have your brain evolve into, well, how can I show that? Yeah, instead of explaining it or talking about it. Yeah. Just have, it's always, we always do this on the show on a, all the shows, it's like maybe it looks the best way of just someone just looking, hmm. not commenting on what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. get, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I always appreciate on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Lieutenant Holt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Holt's great. Like his yeah. um, reactions. And I mean, even if he doesn't have a line, but that the camera will stay on his look mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah, he's so great because he plays all the scenes very straight too, you know, so that... Yeah. And he gives you the perfect reactions. And then that's the thing too, I think, is that you forget that uh, coming up in comedy, not so much anymore. Now everybody has to be funny in comedy. Mm -hmm. You want all the characters to be funny. But there's a very, like, coming up through comedy, there was the straight man and there was the funny guy. Mm -hmm. And the straight man would set up the funny guy. But the straight man, all he did, it was important work, you know. The funny guy wasn't funny without the straight man so mm-hmm. i think he needs that and a holt did that a lot of the time too you know where yeah just, or captain holt. yeah yeah captain holt, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah he is so good yeah he's great so you were in toronto for a while like how many years were you guys working well we did in? kids in the hall there so for five years and then we did the brain candy movie i love brain uh, candy oh, <laughs> i really love brain candy yeah. norm um that movie came out when i was I think I was in high school when it came out and um, I actually had not seen the whole movie until this past week. This is oh. weird because what happened was it was on, was it on Comedy Central a lot? The movie? Yeah. I don't know if the movie was. I've never seen it on TV. I, I It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Well, I would always see it on TV, but I would never see the whole thing. I, I remember I was like always watching it with my brother, but like flip to a channel and brain candy's on. I'm like, what is this movie? And um, I always thought this movie is wild. It It was so bizarre, but I really love it. And then, you know, obviously in prepping for this, this week, I looked at your IMDb and I'm like, what brain candy? (laughs) And I was like, wait, that's that movie. I got, I'm going to watch, you know, when I, when I watched the movie this past week, I actually had seen most of it. But I had never seen the beginning of it pieces. before. I've yeah. done that too with movies too, where I've watched bits and pieces. Yeah. And I always go, did I? I'm uh, the movie. It's so yeah, weird. I but yeah. I, I really like the film. Oh, great. The story is so yeah. funny. And it's such a serious story, actually. It is. Uh, like Kevin, I remember we, were, we decided, because we went in for two weeks and just pitched out ideas, and then we settled on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin said, uh, how smart is it that we're actually making a comedy about depression? And he was worried about it. He said, is that a smart move? <laughs> and I went, I don't know. But it seemed that it was the, uh, what, what was the, I'm trying to um, remember, it was the, not Valium that was popular. It was uh, Something Nation. What was the name of the book that came out that was about the drug that sort of like, it's almost like, uh, it's slipping my mind now. But the idea of being, you know, not feeling angry or sad or, and taking medication for that. And mm-hmm. then, seemed like a good topic yeah so that, that's what we just chased and we thought that idea could then uh touch other characters that was the thing too yeah i when i was watching the film i thought man these guys were so ahead of their time as far as like a storyline goes because i mean now prozac that's it prozac nation that was the book Prozac Nation. Yeah, yeah. And then the uh, Prozac was big, right? It was like the biggest, everybody was taking it back then. But now more and more people are. Yeah. Yeah. It's an epidemic. Yeah, yeah. So I I think um, everyone should watch Brain Candy now. <laughs> they didn't then. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's such a relevant topic now. Back then, I can understand why he was saying, do you think this is so yeah, smart? Yeah. Like, how important is that? Like, should we be doing this? But And it's also interesting at the end of the film, the decision at the end of the film is, no, we do need 
some sadness yes. in us. Like to be yeah. balanced human beings, yeah. we have to be able to feel all of these these feelings. Yeah, you can't. We can't be comatose. No, you can't numb yourself from it. Yeah. The the other uh, thing is that we originally had a very dark ending mm-hmm. that we changed, but um, the the and it was our satirical sort of um, uh, ending where big business won hmm. and Kevin, um, uh, his character ended up taking the, his pill, own pill. And then he was put in a parade and he's just reliving his happiest moment over and over again. It was uh, inventing the pill. Oh. But I think everyone was bummed by it. And so we did the sort of the, the I'm gonna ch- invent a pill to counteract this pill mm-hmm. ending. And, and that's an interesting choice too, that, that yeah. because what is it? Mrs. Hardicure at the end is sobbing her eyes out, and everyone's like celebrating. Yeah, like, right. Yes, <laughs> we do. And and even yes. as the audience member, you're like, oh, thank God, you know, right. this person doesn't have to suffer in their happiness for the rest of their life. Yeah. <laughs> it always great. It's a funny. It's a really. It was a really good ending. Yeah, yeah. Really well, control. yeah. We had to rewrite it and do it quickly, um, and they didn't give us a lot of money. But I think, yeah, I'm happy with the ending. It's good. There was a lot of turmoil about the movie amongst the the group. A lot of people for a long time didn't talk about her or like it. They they were hard on it, mm-hmm. and I think now they're not so hard on it. They've embraced it, I think, a little bit more now. Mm-hmm. Um, one more question about Kids in the Hall. I'm wondering, when you guys would write these sketches, how would you decide who was going to play what female? Oh, uh, yeah, that's... Sometimes they were shuffling, but most of the time it was the person who wrote the sketch decided that I want to play this character. Okay. Um, but sometimes there were shuffling that went on. I remember one time I wrote a sketch and Mark said, you know what? I don't want to play this character. I think I should play the woman and not the guy in this. And I went, all right. Mm-hmm. So there was like, there was, and people were fine with it. Mm-hmm. It's just they they thought, well, I could uh, attack the scene better from this perspective. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to Kevin, he always he said he always played Gilda Radner. He always had Gilda Radner in his mm. head when he played women. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that now. I was wondering, so um, you were talking just a little bit earlier about like, you know, you're given this much money as a budget and you have to shoot, you have a shorter amount of time, but everything's for profit. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering for you, um, what have you seen changed as far as like, you know, the freedoms that you were originally allotted, like when you started working on Kids in the Hall versus like now people of Earth through SNL and Parks and Rec and like all these transitions of shows. I mean, wh- what have you seen change? It's that um, in the short order for sure is different, right? So you have that 10 episode thing. Mm-hmm. You never had that before. Yeah. When I was on King of the Hill, we were doing 26 episodes a season and um and uh, same with um, Parks and Rec and even Brooklyn. It's like 22, I think, or 23, the order. So you, and then the, they have, the networks have money. So you, they, it's never like uh, if you feel like, oh, no, we're not going to make, uh, get the script ready by Friday. They would push back a week and it, it just, there was money there mm-hmm. and you could do that. Because mm-hmm. the schedules are always tight anyway, you know, when yeah. you're doing a TV series, you know that. So that <laughs> how hard it is. It's a yeah. crew's moving very quickly. Yeah. And the good thing about Brooklyn was that we had the three cameras too. Mm-hmm. Now the digital thing is huge, right? I feel that's a different thing too. It's like we shot everything on film and if the film wasn't loaded properly, you had to go back out and shoot it again. I mean, you do have stuff that happens with digital stuff as well, but it's, you can just keep rolling, Yeah. you know, and you can have three cameras roll and then you've covered a scene mm-hmm. where um, back then you would have to shoot this way and then go around and shoot that way. And then you have to, yeah. shoot, you know. I felt like working on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, it was actually luxury that we yeah. had three cameras. Yes. I think in the beginning we were just going to have two. Right. And we had a third camera as like a backup. And then... Um, Giovanni, the yeah. cinematographer, he w- just kept calling for that third camera because we did need it. And right. then all of a sudden it was like, okay, we're shooting with C camera, yeah. you know, every every day. And it just became a thing. It so just it was was really nice. moved so s- smoothly. Mm-hmm. And then people, I find that the crews in LA are great. That they, they uh, and then the, I thought the Brooklyn 99 crew was like the happiest crew I've ever worked with. Yeah, they were a very nice crew. Mm-hmm. Um, 
not that any other crew I worked with were terrible, but they just it seemed very happy to be on the show and very yeah. happy to be there working and um, they loved their jobs, you know? Well, we all talked about how unusual it was for us oh, really? to all really like each other. Yeah, we we would regularly, like in a, in a week, talk about we all really like each other. You know, every department really likes each other and um, this is the best show I've ever worked on. And, you know, people who are new, they're like, oh, I've been told that it's not usual that you know, everyone gets along this well. Right. We were saying, um, yeah, you know, it's it's not usual even that every department gets along this right, well. Right, yeah. But it was really, really nice. Yeah, yeah it was smooth. It was a very happy set. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, uh, actually, Parks and Rec was pretty, for the most part, happy too. I think that was sort of a, a, a lot of the people that I knew there went over there too, and they were yeah. very nice people. But Norm, I don't know. I, I wanted to tell you I worked also on Up All Night. Oh, yes. Emily yeah, Spivey. Yeah, 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 Spivey. Yeah, and that one, that was a very loving crew as well. A, a lot of the camera department from that show moved over to Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Right. Nine, and I don't know. I think it also has something to do with the writers too because the writers were really happy and kind and and I don't know, maybe if it's all also like comedy. Like when I lived in Chicago, I worked on mostly drama. And then since I lived in L.A., I've worked on all comedy. Even I would say MasterChef is kind of comedy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people seem to like get along. And I also really like that it was a very family friendly environment. Like people, there were regular you know, the hiatuses were, were regular. Yeah, I like and, that too. It's good to uh, have a hiatus. Yes. But, oh, speaking of schedule, because yeah. you were saying, you know, a tight schedule. I actually don't know what your schedule is. That was one of my questions. Is, oh. You know, how early in the season do the writers come on and begin writing? Uh, for the people of Earth, it was weird because the, the we started late. I came off Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Mm-hmm. I left in March and I went right on to People of Earth and then started working. And then I went straight through because we wrote all the scripts first, then shot in Toronto. Mm-hmm. So I worked straight through till almost December. So oh I had gosh. very little time off. And then um, like two weeks plus maybe another extra week. And then I got a phone call saying, We're starting up in January. I went, What? And so I was putting back together a room. Uh, and then th- this year, though, we shot and wrote and edited it at the same time so we could hit this air date of July 24th. Mm-hmm. So that was crazy. So now what I did last year has been condensed down into a crazy amount of time. Mm-hmm. It was pressure. It was a little more pressure this year and so harder. So for this past season, this is the second season of People of Earth, you guys began writing when? In January. January of yeah. 2017? Yes. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Okay. And then um, when did you guys start shooting? We started shooting in, so January, um, I think it was the beginning of May. Okay. But there was prep before that, right? So the, like, um, and I couldn't go this year to set. Mm-hmm. So I, we flew a guy down, this guy Aaron, and he watched the set. So I would be in conversation with him, but still be, I had to still write scripts, mm-hmm. get those ready and done. And then we started in, I think it was in May 2 that we had to start, um, we started getting footage back and started cutting stuff and getting things out to the press so that the press could see the first three episodes. So I was like writing, rewriting, and editing. And then while they were shooting, so I was on the phone talking to them. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Now, what is a fully staffed writer's room? Uh, ours was small, it's, and we used pretty much the same people we had last year. Luckily, they were free because of this 10-cycle thing of 10 episodes. A lot of people leave. We, lo- we lost one writer who went to another show. Okay. And I just let people go because they have to work, you know, so I can't. Right. I don't, I don't want to keep people around. So, mm-hmm. I, so yeah, take a job mm-hmm. um, because on Brooklyn, you were there for a full season. You didn't have to think about getting another gig. Mm-hmm. You had that one. But now when you do 10, you go, okay, I'm at 10 and now I'm out of work. Right. And if that show is waiting to be picked up, then you're just, you can't wait around. Mm -hmm. So um, I was lucky enough to get the people that were on last year. Most of them came back. Yeah. Lost a couple. We only added one extra writer. 
like a per, in a perfect world is a writer's room a staff of 10 people yeah it like, can't be what? too big i mean i've worked on really huge i think when king of the hill we had a huge staff but okay. the, we were doing like 26 episodes and it, it was like again it was a full year yeah and there were a lot of writing teams on our on king of the hill so i think there were, oh, three, there were different teams the three writing teams so that you pay the i don't know if you can do this anymore but back then you could pay two people uh as if they were one writer so you got two people you got one extra person so uh we had six people really three writing teams six people wow. plus the, all the other writers i think there was like 14 or 15 writers in that room mm-hmm. but yeah this we had seven mm-hmm. writers eight writers Okay, and yeah. it, what do you think about when people say like, you know, there's no idea that's a bad idea, um, or there's no question that's a bad question, and then I believe that. Yeah, but at a certain time, if you've been on a show uh, like for like uh, five <laughs> years and you're asking the same question, then you go, that's not good. <laughs> you've been on the show for five years, you should know that's a bad question to ask. <laughs> so at a certain point, um, uh, you know, it's like either the show's for you or it isn't. Yeah. And I always yeah. was, I very, I'm very picky. I picked shows that I thought I could write for. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when I saw King of the Hill and I went, oh, I like that. It's all, and King of the Hill was very, another good show for like, you could tell family stories and mm-hmm. um, because it was about family. So yeah. you could bring your family stories to the room. Um, other shows like Parks and Rec, it's more about friends hanging out at an office, so it's a different kind of a show. Mm-hmm. I, I've never worked in uh, the Parks Department, so we did research. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you could still do observational things and apply them, but really, you couldn't really bring your life to it too much. You had to sort of research and think about the characters and uh, apply premises to their world, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit. In Brooklyn Nine Nine, I'm not a cop. Right. But it's, again, friends hanging out. And then, uh, you know, you try and write in terms of those stories, too. Like what with those two characters, what would be a good story and not get caught too much in plot, you know, mm-hmm. and, or what the case is. You could have the case, but what's the story between the two characters, you know? I really liked um, the characters in Brooklyn Nine-Nine because, or I really do like them because as much as they call each other out on their things, they're always so supportive yeah, of each other. Yeah, I like that, too. Yeah. And I like those. I like. I call them little gifts when someone does a nice thing for another character. Yeah. Hands over just a little thing. It doesn't have to be big. And you mm-hmm. go, oh, that was nice that that person thought of the other person and wasn't thinking about themselves all the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, those moments I I find to be that's all you need. Yeah. You know, people go, oh, that was nice. Yeah. The payoffs yeah. are big with yeah. Gina. I yeah. Think. Yeah. You're like, oh, Gina is a good person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's tricky, right? Because she's funny when she's not, right? And that's mm-hmm. what you want. But then, you know, you just can't make her like that all the time. Mm-hmm. You know? I remember, yeah. Um, They're very multi-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, Greg is big on that. Let's layer the people so they're not just one note. Greg Daniels. Just like. Greg Daniels, <laughs> yes. I just throw out a name. Greg's big on that. And you know, who, who's he talking about? <laughs> Greg Daniels. But he actually, it's like, uh, I just feel, I write that like that anyway, but when like, he was good at articulating stuff, like um, when I was at King of the Hill, I go, I want to, he said, well, you were, he would just articulate why you were doing it. And I go, oh yeah, of course, mm-hmm. I would naturally do it, but I couldn't, I didn't have a word for it. He always had theories and w- reasons why you did things, and mm-hmm. I, I found that really helpful. That's amazing. Yeah. To think, yeah, to, it, yeah. To be around people who just think so differently from you, but yes. then it helps, it just helps your thought process to move forward. Yeah. And, and he was really good at bringing together a room that of different people. Mm-hmm. So you have different ideas in the room. He liked that. And I think that's important. Norm, have you ever coined a phrase? Coined a phrase? No. No, I haven't. I don't think I have. Have you noticed like these shows, like, Parks and Rec. I mean, I think there are certain phrases that have come well, out. There's of Parks lines. And Rec now. Yeah, there are lines that I've written that got some traction or something. That, yeah. Yeah. But um, on um, King of the Hill, I wrote an episode where Bobby took a self defense class and he learned to um, a woman's self defense class. He went down to the Y, <laughs> so he uh, learned to uh, kick people in the nuts. That's the, his <laughs> defense, mm-hmm. and he was it was all women in the self defense class. And uh, I remember researching it, and then um, you're supposed to, if a man is grabbing your purse, you say, let go of my purse, you yell it out loud, and then 
kick them. Mm-hmm. And so that became the, I remember it became a t-shirt thing, um, let go of my purse. Was Bobby <laughs> was saying that. And I thought that was kind of a fun one that sort of caught on for a little while. Yeah, like the research really paid yeah, off. Yeah, it did. Actually, it was great. <laughs> and then on uh, Ron Swanson, on um, I was actually, Dan Gore and I, that sort of wrote it together. I said, don't half-ass. He said, don't uh, half-ass one thing. Whole, uh, no, no, don't half-ass two things. Whole-ass one thing. I like that saying. <laughs> don't ha- half-ass two things. Whole-ass one thing. I thought that was a, a funny phrase, too. When you're writing for characters, do you like do you become like do you find yourself gravitating towards a character more than than to another character or do you find yourself yeah gravitating towards story more I go towards story but some characters I feel more com- or like or I just have I just understood them mm-hmm. like I understood the relationship between Hank and Bobby I really like that mm-hmm. relationship like he was a very practical man who liked manly things and had a very sensitive boy who was liked everything and was he liked possibilities and it just drove Hank crazy <laughs> so I like that relationship and yeah. then on Parks and Rec I really like the relationship between Ron Swanson and, and um, Amy Poehler's character you know mm-hmm. so I uh, Leslie I th- thought that they had a great relationship and I liked writing for them too so that there's certain relationships I, I I liked you know that but yeah you just end up pitching story mm-hmm. you know I liked uh, I, I like story that has some kind of emotional thing going on too yeah, I was wondering if when you guys write lines, if you're constantly asking, well, why does this, why is this person saying this? How is this moving? Well, this yeah, for sure, you do do that, and that's uh, that's a, a real thing. But and do you that, just innately think that, or do you guys? Is no, that a I really. Constant topic of it's conversation. A, it's a, that's the hardest part I think about writing is the breaking of the story to make sure okay. that the story makes sense and that mm-hmm. you're following the story. And I like I was saying earlier to simplify it. I like a simple story that hmm. gets complicated. Mm-hmm. You don't have to make it a complicated story out of the gate. Just, you know, the simple story and then just complicate it. Uh, yeah, I always chase the story and is that why, what's their attitude here? That's yeah. the other thing. Why, why they're acting like this now? Mm-hmm. And then shouldn't their attitude change here now? Why are they still acting the same way? Hmm. So yeah, you just, every story ends up revealing itself to you yeah but you you want to be true to what you think the story is you know Mm -hmm. and that might shift i always like say we always uh fool ourselves into writing the story Mm -hmm. we chase it and we think that's the story and then we go oh no that's not the story the story as you're discovering it you go the story is more this and it shifts a little bit wow um but you never you never try and lose the focus or sharpening of that story you know because you don't want the audience to be confused you want (laughs) be able to follow it and you want to make sure that you can defend it like when i always say i want to get on the phone with the network or the studio i want to be able to defend the story i'm telling Mm. like if i can't defend it and if i'm on the phone and i'm going i don't know that's an honest reaction but at the same time i want to be able to at least pretend i know the story i'm telling Mm -hmm. so i could say this is how i see it and they can go oh well shouldn't it be that then and i go oh yeah maybe it's you shifted over here why I thought it was there, I don't know. But at least I'm defending something mm-hmm. that I can sell it to them, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's a real thing that also happens. Is yes, you write us, you writing um, like an episode, and then you have to submit that episode. Yeah, I think it's more so like a, not so much now. Like if you look at uh, um, Netflix and a lot of the, they they just let the the people in the room uh, decide what, and then they're pretty free with not a lot of notes. Um, but um, uh, with TBS, they would want to give notes and stuff, and that's fine, yeah. too. Like Brooklyn, they did that. Mm-hmm. After a while, I think a sh- they would kind of relax on a show because the show becomes the show. Yeah. I think in the beginning, you get that a lot. Uh, yeah, on, on Parks and Rec, they were like that. They The first season was a lot of finding the show, and then the next season, there was a sitting down and sort of discussing it and then just writing the ship a little bit. And then uh, once the show became what it was then everyone relaxed and the notes were lighter and um they just they everybody was on the same page they knew a good parks and rec story versus a bad one and or they were confused by an attitude because they knew the characters as well Well, everybody's sort of finding the characters too yeah i i I said that that there's a discovery period for the writers and the audience like in the like the first three seasons everybody's sort of finding the show together Mm -hmm. so that when we're writing it the audience is also discovering it too. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, the show becomes the show and there's less discovery. 
you have to sort of hopefully introduce new characters so you can find something that can change it up a little bit. But everybody's on board at a certain point, you know. Mm-hmm. How important is the table read to the writers? For comedy, I think it's a bigger deal. There's dramas I know that don't do any table reads. They just shoot. But for comedy, I think it's important. I think uh, people like to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then hear what played or didn't play, or to hear a, a character say a line and you go, oh, yeah, that doesn't quite sound like the character. Or So I think it's important. And also it gives you, oh, we can cut that scene. That scene didn't work. Okay. Yeah, you'll all of a sudden realize like, yeah. it, it disconnected more than connected. Yeah. Well, we can just drop or, it. Or telling too much, like we're hitting that story point again. Why We can just cut it or we can condense it or that joke is lazy. Um, but yeah, I think for, I don't like them because there's too much, like I have to say that on, uh, we did a read, uh, on Parks and Rec and, uh, we did two and doing two scripts in a row is tough. So we did two in a row and the laughs were there, but Greg never, Daniel's never panicked and neither did Mike sure. They just talked about it and mm-hmm. the episodes turned out really good. So that's just having confidence in the stories you're telling and then knowing that it'll get funnier. Mm-hmm. And on the day, too, there was a lot of improvising on, on Parks and Recreation, that, and that's such a great cast. Yeah. That you never worried too much about. Like, I would be on set, and I knew that Amy was there, and that Amy was funny, and that I didn't have to worry about, and that, you know, Chris Pratt was there, and he could be funny, and, you know, all these people were funny and really good in the role, so I yeah. never worried. I trusted them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and if they ever seemed worried, then it was my job to help them try and figure it out. And then, uh, but it was never really a concern. It was always, and if we did something, you know, that's why you have editing too. If it doesn't work, you cut it out. So uh, that's what I like about the editing process. So you think you had a great scene and you go, ah, it's not that good. You just cut it. Um, when you guys were writing for Parks and Rec, did you write for the fourth wall? Because you, obviously you're writing for the audience and we are the fourth wall. Right. But then. You have a, always have an eye on the audience to make sure it's entertaining and the story makes sense. Yeah. And then it's presentational because you had those those uh, documentary kind of... Yeah, that's what I mean. Is it, Yeah, Greg's could, rule, Greg Daniels' yeah, rule, because yeah. he came from the office. We did it less so on Parks and Rec, but was not to be ex- not to have someone tell us the story. But like, they could look at the camera whenever... Oh, yeah, they could look at the camera and look right in, down the barrel of the camera. Could they look there whenever they wanted to? Or yes, there- yeah. So um, if they felt the beat, they could... And just... each character had their own relationship with the camera. Like, Chris Pratt always was aware of the camera, <laughs> which I kind of liked. Yeah. And Amy chose to, to look at the camera every once in a while. And she chose her moments, yeah. which I thought was interesting. So she made them special. Uh, whereas Chris was always in a relationship with the, <laughs> uh, the audience. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was kind of cool. Because you always felt like you were in on something with yeah. them. Yeah. They did it more on The Office. Everyone was aware of the camera yeah. and being caught on camera more yeah uh, parks and rec we didn't do it as much yeah it felt very special yes when it would happen yeah. like when aziz would yes aziz was more aware of it too he was a guy that was aware of the camera a little bit too mm-hmm. so i think each character had their own relationship with it you know like ron swanson barely looked at the camera you could tell like he probably didn't like the idea of having people around <laughs> filming what was going on it was all annoying to him <laughs> Because he was a guy that kept everything in, right? Yes, so totally. it was like, yeah. It was probably inefficient. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's frivolous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on Brooklyn Nine Nine, um, we were invited to go to table reads if we wanted to. Right. That was the first show that like crew members were that I had been on that crew members were allowed to participate. Or maybe the other shows I had been on, they just didn't think to invite the crew members. But right. Andy had asked me if I, he's like, do you want to come to a table read? And I was like, can I? And he's like, well, I'm asking you. Right. So I said, <laughs> yeah, I want to go because we That's were funny. given the scripts. Right. So I went and I wanted to go every week from there on out because Dan Gore was so good at, like he was so hospitable in introducing everybody and saying, you know, this person's playing, you know, I felt like I was on an episode of like, wait, wait, don't tell me or, <laughs> but as far as like a host, him right. hosting just a simple table read, it was so inviting and there was so much hype around it and it made it feel like everyone who worked on this script was pumped. The actors were pumped to be there. That's good, and then right? Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I really remember it, like it. it's, there's good and bad to it. I remember it's Saturday Night Live. Everyone had to be there because it's a live show. So everyone was in the room 
Hmm. And you have to put together a show in a week. So everybody had to be there to hear what the sketches were and then the choices. And then the, and then you had to sort of produce each sketch and you had to talk to every department. So hmm. that's what was great about that show. You got to work with everyone. Mm-hmm. You had to say, no, it's got to be this kind of a shirt. Or, uh, no, that prop is too much, too big. It's got to be smaller. So hmm. you were... you you produced your sketch every week and that was good for me because as I move forward then I knew what I needed or didn't want or I got a feeling of what I needed in sketches and tv shows so how did it work that you were brought on as a writer to uh, Saturday Night Live well because Lauren Michaels produced uh, Kids in the Hall and so when that show went down and he also produced Brain Candy that when the show went down he said do you want to that was offered a job at Saturday Night Live and there was no other work in Canada at the time and Mark was going as well, and we sort of thought, well, let's do it. So you and Mark both wrote? Yes. For, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Mark had written for one year with Bruce uh, when they were doing the pilot. I think Lauren brought them on to sort of give them an education of what it was like to write on a TV show. Mm-hmm. And then they could then take that back to the room, to the kids in the hall room, and sort of say, this is how they do it. But, uh, yeah, the show back then, too, was more presentational for the kids in the hall. And as the show moved forward, it became more about more films, and and, uh, and they still did live stuff, but they did. We actually concentrated on a lot of the films too. Mm-hmm. You wrote how how many years were you on SNL for? Three years. Okay. So it was like a, there during a really weird uh, period. It was like Chris Elliott was there, Janine Garofalo, um, Al Franken was writing on the show, and Jack Handy. So these are all like comedy writing heroes of mine that I got to write with, which was kind of fun. Oh my goodness! And then. Um, that was the last season that Adam Sandler was there and Kevin Nealon. There were a lot of, like, uh, Chris Farley was there. Mm-hmm. And um, and then there was hmm. a big shakeup. Oh, and Mike Myers was there. He was, And then the, a lot of people left. And then Will Ferrell came in. And then um, Molly Shannon, Anna Gasteyer. Whole she's so good. Yeah, she's great. So there was a transition. You, yes. You, and I a- was there. And then, the, the, yeah, so I was there for two more years and then left. I'd done sketch comedy for seven years, so I just thought... And then I had an offer to go to King of the Hill, and I just took it. That's so cool. Yeah. But it sounds like you've had some very interesting challenges as a writer. Like, yeah. on SNL, it's like you're writing per week. Yes. Show per week. That and then you had grueling. a transition, yeah. your whole cast. Was that... Well, yeah, it's a big shakeup. But, like, it's a weird sort of thing that, that when you go in there, you're just figuring it out. Everybody is. The actors the writers and then you know one week you'll get two sketches in the next week you won't get anything in hmm. and then the following week you'll get one in and then there'll be uh, uh like your the next week nothing it's so it's so it's a real ro- roller coaster ride and yeah. i like to write with a bunch of because i came from that background right of writing with bruce and then writing with so i just thought everybody i'll write with everybody um um, but there it's not, I don't know actually No, know you how sort of, works. like you get into a thing where you find something and you write it. Okay. And you sort of get into writing that thing. And I was always open to just writing with a whole bunch of people. Okay, so on that show, every person writes their own and then you submit. Yes. And but, then they choose. Yeah, when I was there too, there was more, of, there was kind of the old school of writer's pieces. And then writers would write the pieces and the uh, cast would do them. Um, then it became more of a, it sort of switched over to the cast wanting, doing characters and then writing with writers. Hmm. So there was more of a mashup of the two. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't like the two separate camps Hmm. and there was more of a push towards that. So in the third season, I was writing with Anna Gastar quite a bit and that was fun. Yeah. Because everybody writes, that's everyone who is also acting on the show has either written or is writing? On yeah, the show? they, the, I mean, uh, Anna, you know, because she, uh, they're right through character, right? So uh, everybody would write their pieces through character. And uh, like the the cheerleaders, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, they would work them out, and Paula Pell would help write them down and make suggestions, and then they work on the cheers. And so they were like, it was, uh, you know, Will and, you know, Paula, and then they would just sit down and, and write them. Sherry O'Terry, right? Because yeah. so three of them were in a room just writing and working on the routine and figuring it out. They would, you could hear them like all <laughs> night in another room working on it while you were writing something in another room. It was kind of wild. I mean, that really, that, that whole sketch really caught on. Yeah, yeah, it went crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For you, 
have you always been akin to pop culture? Like some people are just naturally soak up pop culture or pay attention to it. Yeah. Do you? Uh, no, so- I don't think so. For me, like it was always just uh, like the thing about the kids in the hall, and I still believe in this a little bit, is that if you write a story about family or, or relationships, over time that survives. If you're caught up in pop culture, pop culture a little bit it'll just it'll live in its time and then it'll Mm. and that's it so we avoided any kind of references Mm -hmm. um it was just like you know you know just work school family all those kind of observational things so i always like like a good that's why i always stick to an emotional story Mm -hmm. not that like greg is big on also uh, greg daniels is always big on so what's happening now to include that in the happening of now so like the penguin story on parks and recreation right well we wanted to infuse more things that were going on and we thought it would it helped because she's a government worker that 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 would be good Mm -hmm. so that we were just talking about different issues you know and then that came up and then we ended up writing that episode so i mean not that we don't do it but i yeah i just like to write about people people in relationships and then people tend to uh, recognize the mm-hmm. things that because everyone's in a relationship and yeah, yeah. that makes it 100 yeah. percent relatable yeah, yeah, exactly. and doesn't make you feel yeah. like it, that touches excluded. the heart yeah but at the same time i like watching comedies that i learned something too or like you know like i like the horror uh, get out did you see the movie get out i really yes. liked it and yeah. it was uh but it had like the horror genre thing but it was also a comedy mm-hmm. and it's just uh like it's a, a, a whole world you know, that I like went, oh, yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. I don't walk through that world at all, right? So mm-hmm. uh, that's, and you can laugh at it too, right? So that's the great thing about comedy. You can have those awkward moments, but still laugh at them. Yeah, yeah. We were, so one of my friends is hosting uh, like a Sunday night film night. And right now we're going through comedic thrillers. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so we were just talking um, this past week about like, so there's different, I guess, different c- types of, of comedic thrillers. There's like a closed, uh, and then thrillers also. Right, right. Closed thrillers. Um, we watched Hot Fuzz. Oh, and yeah. We <laughs> talked fair. about that that's a closed, right. open comedic thriller. And then when I was, and then we were talking about like Rosemary's Baby and North by Northwest is like a classic closed thriller. Now, what do you and mean by closed? What do you guys? It's like, I guess, because I didn't know this at all, but my friend Brennan, who's who's leading the group, he said closed is when the character literally has no idea of what's going on to ah, the end. Ah, interesting, right. Yeah, so we were just saying like Rosemary's Baby is like, yeah, is closed. Right. North by Northwest closed. Yeah. And then um, Hot Fuzz is like, closed open because he finds out maybe two thirds of the way through right what the deal is right and um when i was on the phone with my mom my mom's like a big film buff she was like now i think that get out is a closed open comedic thriller colleen i was like i think you're right mom (laughs) did you turn her on to that phrase the closed open or does she know about it oh we were talking about it okay and i was giving her examples and then she just randomly said no i think i think get out is the is the closed open <laughs> yeah i never i've never heard that term before it's interesting me neither but now i'm like kind of recognizing yeah, right. it in all these different types of stories movies that are just coming back to mind like oh yeah that is or there's a open the open comedic thriller where you are kind of in on it the whole entire right. time that's a thing that um we did i remember we and Parks and Rec, it was this episode where the woman of the year, you know, um, where Ron Swanson wins and, it, and um, Leslie thought she was going to win, but she didn't win, but Ron Swanson got it. <laughs> the, the, the thing that we had to do is like, should, should he tease Leslie and we don't know why he's teasing her? Hmm. And then he, but we decided that that came off too mean. Like if we know that Ron, that's what we use the camera, him speaking to camera and saying, you know, I'm going to do this to teach her a lesson. And then you go, oh, okay. So you can enjoy it then yeah. without feeling like feeling tense and going, why is he being so mean to her? Mm-hmm. And then revealing it later. Mm-hmm. So knowing what the game was and that, oh, he's going to teach her a lesson 
that these awards are important. You should just forget the awards. You just do the work for the work's sake. Mm-hmm. Um, and Amy, uh, like Amy's character loved awards and to be recognized, she loved those things. So yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so that was the, the fun thing. But to know that he revealed that the same, this is what I'm going to do and told the audience, then you go, oh, you can kind of relax into it and you go, oh, he's just trying to teach her a lesson mm-hmm. and you can enjoy it then, you know? Mm-hmm. So that, those are the conversations you have in the... It's a, I don't know if that's the open close thing too or not. Yeah, that sounds open. (laughs) Sounds very open. You're letting everybody participate in it for sure. That's that's very interesting. Norm, I want to go back to when you said you were filling out that questionnaire growing up because this has been circulating in my head. When you would see titles like lawyer or, I don't know, scientist, I know that's not very descriptive, but... Why is it that you felt like those things were not you? Like even just seeing those those titles on a piece know. of paper. It's just so weird that just the, I thought, well, I have to do these jobs. Uh-huh. And then I went, uh, I guess, and then I just thought that I had, I don't know, it's weird. I, did, I didn't have a voice for it, and I was just a kid, right? So I went, I know I don't want to do these things. There's nothing here that says that, that I recognize yeah. And I remember growing up and loving television. I mean, I watched Bugs Bunny and I watched the Flintstones and I like I I loved Mary Tyler Moore and I I, I loved All in the Family. Like mm. these are shows that I really liked and um uh and I I knew what I liked about them too back then. Mm-hmm. But then I never thought that I well, oh I'm going to write TV. Or that's what I want to do or I it took me a long time to figure out oh there's actually a person writing those shows and oh <laughs> like it it just didn't. And but when I watched Monty Python, I remember waiting to the end to see who wrote it. Hmm. I remember looking for the credits, and I went, "Oh, the guys who are performing it are actually writing it too." Um, and I went, "Oh, that's interesting." Mm-hmm. So, like I, like I knew I liked those things, and I was interested in them, but I didn't really think that that would I would be writing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you think no, not me. Mm-hmm. But then now I'm doing it, and I go, "All right." I guess I always knew, but I didn't want to admit it or something. Did you ever feel frustrated, um, like that you couldn't pick something that you that you wanted to be? No, I. I mean, just I just thought I guess I'm resigned to doing some job that I didn't want to do or something. That's oh okay. Yeah, I thought oh okay I'll like these are my options. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll pick I guess one so. later. <laughs> um, and also, my dad was always a big believer of like, uh, make sure you make money, you know, and mm-hmm. and you're comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, oh, I guess that's what I have to do. I remember actually Sean Keane saying to me, he had a friend that worked in Los Angeles, and he said he works on a sitcom. Uh, a friend of his worked on a sitcom, and he makes pretty good money writing on a sitcom. And I went, oh, really? There's a you can do that? Hmm. And I thought, I guess. And then in Canada, we didn't have that system, so. I thought, oh, if I stay here, I didn't think that then, but if I'm living in Canada, I won't be doing that. And then um, I remember working on Kids in the Hall and talking to uh, one of the producers from HBO, and she's saying, you know, you can, there's, people make a very good living writing sitcoms. And I went, oh, that's the second time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should do that. Like a little I, foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah. So when I got the chance to do it, uh, when Greg Daniels phoned up to say, "Hey, there's this thing, King of the Hill. Mm-hmm. Do you want to work on?" It? I went, "Yeah, I, I think I do." Hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because I didn't want to write sketches anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with sketches, but you just get. I thought I want to write long form. I would like to learn how to do that. Mm-hmm. And so I, if I get a chance to do it, why not take the chance? You know. Well, it sounds like you were always attracted to story. Yeah, I guess I didn't know that. And even in my sketches, I would work on story within the sketches. Mm-hmm. And I always had a little emotional thing going on within the sketches, too. Mm-hmm. That was always a bit of a fight. Uh, like with Kevin and Dave, they just like pure comedy and say, ah, not all the time, but th- that was sort of the discussion. Of like, well, I could be in it on a sort of like a, an emotional down note and yeah. sad, funny, and they would go, ah. Should be a joke there, you know. So that, so that was a bit of that. But Dave also liked pathos. He would have really good sketches that had just had said character moments, and so it's not as if they didn't understand it. But it was always each sketch, individual sketch that you would fight for. Mm-hmm. Should we end on a bigger moment or a smaller moment or just a sad comedy moment? Mm-hmm. It also seems to me that. You really enjoy learning. Yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, that's for me the biggest thing. Yeah, if you stop learning, then 
it's over. But it was interesting because I, I also struggled as a kid, like, you know, knowing what to say I wanted to be when I grew up. I just really could not see it. I couldn't see it like a vision for it or anything. Right. Um, so I just felt like really confused when we had to pick something like that. But I do enjoy learning. And a lot of those professions are cool. Like you can learn a lot of things in those professions. But also for me, I felt like, that is not exactly what I'm interested in. Knowing now, you know, years later, I understand I really liked the art of storytelling. Right. Do you have a family that, like, did you have a mom that wrote or a dad that did? So my mom comes from, like, my whole mom's side of the family is very artistic. And my mom, she's like a Renaissance person. Like, whatever she puts her hand to is done well. But she used to write a lot for Mad Magazine growing up. Oh, really? Yeah, but she was totally freelance. Like she would come up with these ideas and then write them and submit them. I did that and I never got anything submitted. Really? Yeah, yeah, never. (laughs) But I remember doing that. How dare they? I know, but it was probably not very good. So that's fine. I mean, but like that's the thing was that it's cool that she did that and they got they picked them and that was on her own. Like (laughs) she she didn't go to school for writing or anything, but she was always. Um, Well, she did go to film school in Milwaukee, actually. Oh, wow. And was making some short films. See, I'm fascinated by people that just know that they're creative. And they, if you have that support system, then you you seek it out. Like, I had trouble finding it, right? That was the thing. I was in Montreal Ah. and trying to find it. And then when I found people, I went, oh, this is what I want to do. But that's so cool. I always, that's why I'm fascinated by families that have, like, just, they pass it down to their kids you know the the idea of doing the arts or that's it's a, like a good that's thing a to, possibility yeah, yeah, to a possibility. do it or the the courage to explore it yeah even if it's not the same thing like my grandma is an amazing painter oh, oh. and uh she writes children's books oh really that's and she's cool. like 90 and I, I don't paint. I mean, I don't know how to paint, um, but... But are you curious about it? See, I'm curious totally. about painting. I'm curious. I want to learn about it, too. Okay. And then take courses and, and stuff, but... Uh, I am curious about it. That would be very interesting, too. Right. Do you know, like, what class you would want to start mm, with? No. I just kind of feel like they would be fun to do. Yeah. You're, like, painting yeah. 101. Yes. So, like, all of it yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then break the rules. I think you have to know the rules to break them, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can think I can get on and just start painting and it just be more therapeutic mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. actually a thing, you know. But if you really want to paint, I think you have to sort of learn about it mm-hmm. and then yeah. go, uh, I like this over that. And then, you know, pop art is so different now, too, with Andy Warhol and everything. It's just a different approaches too. Mm-hmm. Did you have any artists in your family? My dad could draw. Huh. Uh, and I think he w- he was on the board when he was an engineer and would draw. So it was all lines. and But uh, he could draw. He did a little bit of it when he was uh, retired, but then he stopped. He didn't really do it. Did, what about your grandparents or aunts mm, and uncles? No. Do you have sisters and brothers? I have a brother. And, and he's a social worker. Oh. Yeah. So he's doing a relational yeah. job. Yeah. He's in Which is Cal- interesting. Yeah. Yours is relational. Yeah, yeah. But he's helping people. <laughs> I don't know if I'm helping people, but I, I guess so. Maybe I don't know. But you're the, entertaining. You're yeah, entertaining a lot of people. To but people. They, but I kind of admire people who do that kind of thing. Greg Daniels always said that when someone was a doctor and they quit to become a writer, you go, "Why did you do that? You could have been a doctor and helped people." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always pissed them off that people just quit to write comedy. that's really that's the other thing too i think i would would have done what my brother is doing some kind of thing like that if i didn't get into this i would have probably ended up doing that but i like taking pictures too and a paint uh, pictures is a different way of painting too Mm -hmm. yeah yeah because you are seeing the light yeah you have to yeah you have to and the composition as well as the foreground middle ground background and it's in the moment too is the big moment and you look at paintings they choose a moment that they paint Mm -hmm. like uh you know someone you know, like hopping over like a puddle or something like that. Like just like those moments that are captured. And then you do that in painting as well. It's all someone revealing something in the painting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess I'm kind of curious about what, 
I don't want to say what's next for you because that's not even, but what are other things you want to learn painting and what other things kind of fascinate you right now that... I would mind, like a doc, I started in documentary filmmaking and I keep thinking I'm going to buy a camera and I'm going to shoot something and I'm going to chase us. I have like another way of doing a story, just uh, the learning process of like meeting someone and learning about them and then going, oh, I think the story is this. And then you find out something else about them. And you go, oh, the story's not that. It's this is the story. Mm-hmm. And then following that person and just getting to know them and shooting them and showing them in their world and how they move through the world. I kind of wouldn't mind doing that. I don't have an idea for a documentary quite yet. But I just know that I would like to maybe do that. Yeah. And I like the editing process, too. I like sort of finding the story in an editing room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you ever want to uh, direct? Or do you direct right I now? I directed one of the Parks and Rec uh, episodes. Okay. And I found that. And I did uh, do some directing on Kids in the Hall, um, some sketches. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe if I wrote something, maybe direct something I wrote. I find it hard to... It's the pressure again, I, like I found when I was acting, that I didn't want to screw up the, the script or their lines or, you know. So I the same thing with directing a little bit. Like um, I find that if I'm on someone else's TV show, mm. you don't want to screw it up. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure you get what they do and make sure that's on the screen. Right. But if I feel like if it's mine, I can screw it up mm-hmm. and I can learn and screw it up. Yeah. And the only one I'm disappointing is myself. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, the pressure's really off. Really mutilated that line. <laughs> Wait, that's the line I wrote. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. And then at the certain time, if you write that line and you realize in editing, that's a crappy line, you just cut it. So, yeah, that's mine to ruin if I want, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you want to do documentaries because it's, it's totally the opposite system and process of what you currently are in. Yeah. You, you work backwards. You don't, yes. you, you like figure out what your script is. Yeah. Like you said, look for the story yeah. later. And here the story will reveal itself in a weird way to you. It's, you do the same thing. You'll probably chase a story that you think is the story hmm. and then have the story be, hopefully it will change slightly and shift. And so you go, oh, as you're shooting it, you go, that's the story. It's not the story that I thought it was, you know? Yeah. Um, while we've been talking, was there anything that was coming to your mind that you wanted to express or like any thoughts for up and coming writers? I think it's an exciting time actually for like the, the for writers. And uh, there's a real push for um, more female centered stories, which I think is exciting because we have guy stories been told for a very long time. So it's nice to have more of that push, I think. Mm-hmm. And those will be new and different stories mm-hmm. told from a different perspective because we've only, you know, over the years, we've been seeing the same type of story. Like we have, I like them. I like um, Goodfellows and I like those kind of stories. Those yeah. are guy stories though. Those are real men stories. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and the women are are a part of their story in the background. So it's nice to see like stories where the women are the foreground and the guys are in the background, and and just to see women move through the world. Mm-hmm. And women watch TV more than guys do, hmm. and films. I think they're they want also they want to seek out those stories. So I think that's exciting. And so I think new writers coming in too. You can start a thing and then. Uh, go if it's good people are looking for it they want content right so you can go out and sell something to netflix as if, if it's good and now i like the, the different ways of telling stories like anthologies you can just tell one season and then move on and tell another story um in the old days you used to have to say how long will this is this going to last 10 seasons and you go i don't know yeah so now i like the idea of like something could last a season and then you're moving on to another idea or it lasts only three seasons and it dies and mm-hmm. and that's the life of that show you know so yeah it doesn't feel yeah. as like everything's at stake yes if- it doesn't have to be 26 episodes every season i like that there's 10 or six or eight or i mean it's harder for um to find work and keep that going but for sure it's you can take an idea and then it can run its length and then it's over mm-hmm it's a different world now, too. Don't you think it's like I'm growing up in a I just think I'm out of touch. It's like a completely different world. And I feel like the young people are like you're coming in. I have things to learn from them because I, I don't know. I'm out of touch a lot of the time. Hmm. I think it's really interesting. I don't know if this is always how writers rooms have worked, but I like that like a lot of the writers from Parks and Recreation 
or maybe up and coming writers from Parks and Rec were on Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah. And then like I saw, is it Bridget? Is Bridget? Yeah, writing she's with you yeah on yeah. People of yeah. I Earth? brought her on. Yeah, she's great. So I like seeing like people graduating or like um, people who've been writing for a long time, like yourself, helping other writers come up and giving them opportunities. Sure, and- yeah, because if you were coming up too and you were looking for people to give you a chance, why not give, you know, I was always saying, and Greg Daniels did that to me. He said, come on on to this show and write on this show. So I went, all right. So mm-hmm. I got to learn and I got a chance to do that, you know. You end up working with those people again anyway because mm-hmm. they gave you a chance and they have the same sensibility. Norm, I wonder if you can describe just for the listeners um, what a showrunner is. Oh, well, the showrunner does everything. I mean, you have to sort of, uh, you, you're the captain of the boat in a weird way, and creatively, so you have to make sure that creatively everything uh, makes sense and, and the tone of the show is kept true. Mm-hmm. So you bring on writers that will do that, and you help break the stories. So you sit down and break the stories and then run the writing room and make sure the scripts are out there. Then you talk to the crew and make sure that they're on board. Uh, Like, you know, that uh, on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Dan Gore would have tone meetings with the director and talk to the director and make sure that that we're getting the shots that we need, that the story's still being told. And then in editing, you have your last shot of of making sure that you're telling the story you want to tell. You're like the gatekeeper in a weird way. Yeah. So it's the open and closed idea, too, where you're open Hmm. in the beginning and then you start closing things down. Like I always say when you're on set, too, to make sure that it's always there's a playfulness still there that you're not you're locked into the script. You want to make sure that you get that. But at the same time, it's still open Mm -hmm. and that ideas and mistakes can be good. They can actually lift it up open up a door that you didn't think was there you know and so it's should be always playful if you can and i think that's what a showrunner should do is like and make get a room together mix of people that have that sort of like feeling you know Mm -hmm. i i am amazed at that position because it's such a it's like a bridge to all these different departments the communicating and well this year was tough because i had to do i think i've watched i've watched showrunners over the years and i've had and i've done a couple of my own things that have failed and, uh, and I've run other shows that have uh, I have admire the person who runs the show like mm-hmm. like I look at Mike Shore and they they come in and that after a certain time you just see how tiring it is like they they have to think about the show all the time mm-hmm. the big picture of the show just not the the thing that's in front of you you know mm-hmm. like if you write a script and you're worried about your script or if you're worried about breaking a story you worry about that story but they're thinking about everything all the time mm-hmm. and each stage of the show at every time so it's like it's mind numbing yeah <laughs> after some I remember at some point in the season I was going this is like there was like rewriting a script uh, getting a table and rewriting that, still breaking a new story, sending out an outline, getting the approval of that, editing another thing. The same. So you have like four things that are layers of notes that you're addressing and you're trying to keep them all in your brain. Yeah. And then this show for sure has an arc, you know, mm-hmm. and we have to think about the arc. So I have to keep that in my brain and make sure that the, the arc is being kept mm-hmm. true and that the emotional stories are real and feel real, that there's enough comedy in it. <laughs> It's definitely a very funny show. Oh, good. And um, so People of Earth. Yes. You said it's a sci-fi Fi, comedic. Drama. It's got drama in it. Yeah. There's moments and where we just play the drama and we just play the sci-fi moments, the tropes, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, you guys are doing a great job of oh, um, good. Um, yeah, it's a big threading cast those too. genres together. Yeah. It's a huge cast. And all the characters are lovable. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. And then the, I really like the the group, the people in the group. It's good to have them arguing, but it's also good to see that they do like each other mm-hmm. and they share a, a common thing. And David, when he conceived of the show, also had the same idea for the aliens, too, even though they're working together on this thing of coming down to Earth and maybe taking over Earth. They're still they're working together. And they sort of have their relationships and they're figuring it out too, you know? Mm -hmm. So I always like that idea of the groups, each group, like trying to figure out their little group, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I was quickly um, becoming addicted to the show. And so, you know, it's really (laughs) nice to be able to binge watch 
a season. Yeah. And then when I just watched the first episode of season two, I was like, oh, I have to wait now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. this is a good thing to yeah. wait for. Are there any shows that you're currently watching? I like Better Call Saul. I don't know. I just, I like last season. I really liked it. I like Michael McKean. I think he's really good in it. And Bob Odenkirk's great in it. Mm-hmm. I just like the writing. It's, uh, um, they really take their time too. And they like, it's a very visual show as well, which I kind of like. Um, I was a big fan of Sopranos when it was out. That sort of was a very visceral show too. Mm-hmm. But it was, I thought it did a good job of like exploring every character. But I, yeah, I, it's hard to watch comedies. I find that because I write them, <laughs> yeah. they're hard to watch. Is and it too formulaic or like you're paying attention too well, much? Well, for... I can't, I try, I, like I want to try and just enjoy them, you know, but yeah. I, my brain, I can't turn it off because I'm, I do it, you know, for a living. <laughs> so I, I just want to just have a wash over me. Mm-hmm. I want to just be an audience member, but I find it hard when you're behind the scenes and you do it. It's hard to just to sit back and kind of just laugh at something. Yeah. yeah. Are th- is there anything that you won't tolerate? Like you're watching something and you're like, I will not tolerate this. This is. Like, they're playing me for a fool, or well, like you feel like. Uh, yeah, I, I have trouble with. Uh, I'm not a big. Um, um, I don't like multicam uh. sitcoms that much. I've, I that can laughter. I don't really trust, and <laughs> I don't know. And the, those cast members are funny, and they probably do the lines really well. Right. But at the same time, I just sort of want to just watch it and and then not have me be told what's funny and not funny and have an audience laugh track tell me what's funny Mm -hmm. i just like to watch it yeah and laugh at it or not laugh at it yeah you want to have your own (laughs) experience yeah with what you're watching so multicams i find very hard i and like i said i like uh, films so i i think visually i tend to want to shoot and write like that Mm -hmm. it's more like a play when you watch it on for a multicam so what about um feature films are there like specific genres of Feature films I got that you... spoiled when I grew up because that was a very like exciting time I thought for a film in uh, um, America. Mm-hmm. It was in the sixties and seventies, so that filmmaking was really exciting I thought. And then there was also the foreign films that I got turned on to as well. So now watch watching it, I'm a little bummed that there's so much of the comic book hero stuff that I'm I'm, I'm mm. not so excited about it. Mm. You feel like it'll pass. I hope so. I'm tired of just seeing like now they have they can't they have to have superheroes that are have human faults. They can like <laughs> they can't have humans with human faults. They have to must have superheroes. Like nobody right. can just be human. There has to be something special about them. They have to have extra power, but then they have to be human as well. Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. So I just want a story about a human. That would be okay. Mm-hmm. I always seek out smaller films. I think and. And just stories about people. Do you like uh, Lars and the Real Girl? Yeah, I did like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like independent films a lot because mm-hmm. they, I root for them, you know. Mm-hmm. The, uh, it's, they're taking a chance. It's done on a very small budget. It's shot very quickly. Everybody's on board to do this quirky little thing, you know. So you want you want it to work. So, I mean, I'm, uh, I give them more of a pass if they don't work, you know. Mm. Right. They tried something and failed, and I kind of applaud that. Whereas, like okay, it's another superhero movie and it's going to make a lot of money and they'll make money back on their foreign sales. And I go, all right. Did you ever see The Station Agent? Oh, I love that too. Yeah, it's so yeah. good, right? <laughs> yeah. When yeah. I was home once, my mom was like, let's watch this movie together. And I was like, what is it? And she's like, it's The Station Agent. I haven't seen it before, but I think it's going to be really good. <laughs> she has like a really good inner understanding of right. she, her intuition is always right on with these well, see that's films. kind of fun that you can do that with your mom that you could sit back and watch those movies like if i said to my parents let's watch this small independent film they go what well, did they ever Why do your parents do understand what you do did they ever understand they sort of do now and my okay. mom knows that i get recognition for it so she kind okay. of likes that and she'll say someone saw your show and so uh but the it took them a long time to understand what it, what I did and why I was doing it. And and my dad was just relieved I was making money doing mm-hmm. it. That for him was like, okay, so he's making money. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, it is a foreign concept like for, for people who don't work in the industry or yes. to even understand the industry. It is such a bizarre realm. Yeah. Like the hierarchy of it is strange. And I remember I was talking about stand-ins once and somebody said, wait, that's a job? That somebody yeah, is a stand-in? Yeah, I know, right? I'm like, Yeah. 
why? And I'm like, because we got to block and light and we got to rehearse. And I was explaining the whole, like right. the, how the system works. And they're right. like, oh. I know. It's funny, too. When, when people ask me to write on a TV show, they go, which character do you write for? They think you write for one specific character. Oh, and I go, nope. I, we write the whole thing together. We we should you have to write for all the characters, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's interesting that they think, oh, which one do you write for? Yeah. yeah, yeah, like you're assigned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a friend, Katie Colleton. She's on a show called Teachers, and they're all. Oh, I know some people that were uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, one of the Katies yeah, yeah, that's yeah, on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was telling me she rarely ever writes for her character. Oh, really? Because they all write for. They, like all the girls that are on the show are also all the writers. Right, yes. And uh, she was saying, yeah, she's like, I just, I don't really write for my character um, because I'll often write for this character. But I mean, they all work collaboratively together, but right. for some reason she doesn't often write they for They write herself. all their own scripts, right? I yeah. Think, you know, that's amazing. Isn't that wild? I think that's good though. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea of the performers writing their own stuff too. I mean, mm -hmm. I sort of, because of Monty Python did that and... Mm. Um, Christopher Guest and Michael McKee and all those guys wrote for their own characters and wrote their own scripts. So I, so I, know, I come up from that, you know? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, it's kind of neat to see that it's still going on. I like that. Yeah. And there's a certain chemistry, too. Like the kids in the hall had a chemistry, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard to find, you know? Yeah. And to find like-minded people. I really like the reveals in Kids in the Hall, the reveal of... You know, maybe you guys like open up the scene with two people and then you all of a sudden re reveal like a third person. Yes. And it's like Kevin dressed as as a woman or something. But right. it's always so funny to to see who it is that's revealed. Yeah. And what form the the females in. Yeah. 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 So I know. funny. Yeah. They were so I, it was interesting. I think that. That was sort of the hit that the show had. It was the guys doing drag, you know. Mm -hmm. But they always their thing was that they wanted to play the women real. Like hmm. the if you saw Mark play a mom, it would be partly his mom, you know. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> so did Scott. Scott played his mother as well. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was so kind of neat to see. Well, wrapping. Uh, yeah, um, yes, yes. Possibly. Yeah, let's wrap up. Um, I'm wondering a few things about Canada. Um, wondering if you have like any thoughts about what you would like um, people in the U.S. to know about Canadians or the listener in general, because there are people who listen to the show that are not from the States. I say just you should go down and um, like there's a, I'm amazed at how many people uh, who live in North America don't go to Canada, that a lot of Americans have never been to Canada. And I go, you've never been to Canada? Like the idea of like, being not that far from another place why wouldn't you go explore it and so like you should just go out and that will like i just uh jen who is this um director on people of earth she were also directed on um the office and was a writer on the show hmm. she just flew to newfoundland and went there and hung out there and she said she loved it and i think that's what just go down and check out canada and there's different people too in different parts of the country that are You'll, you'll find out that people, some people don't like Toronto. Like they think they're kind of snobby. And uh, and so wow. like that's the kind of thing that you find out when you live in Canada. Mm -hmm. You just, that's part of being Canadian. But, and living in the States, it's like I'm amazed at how much, how little people know about Canada mm -hmm. and how not very interested they are in them. So Yeah, it's very strange. And for it? us, it's like always America. We're always, but I mean, people go, yes, of course you're interested in America because America is interesting, but... I think <laughs> that's what? the attitude I get. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I go, well, no, but the, oh, no, uh, we are interested in America. And then it, it has a big influence. But we, I think because we grew up also, um, you know, are connected to England as well, yeah. that that's a big uh, part of our upbringing too, right? Mm -hmm. So we were always interested in looking out into the world. And I think that's what I find interesting about Europe. It's like Europeans just know about Europe, you know? They mm -hmm. just are not interested in just Italy. They know everything else that's going on around them, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think maybe it's because of the, the how big our countries are. But I think that's what Americans should do. Just check out Canada. Yeah, where yeah. do you think would be a good first well, place like, to visit? Oh, I like uh, Montreal is a great city that's very diverse. I think Toronto's become a very diverse city. And I love Vancouver. If you're an outdoors person, mm -hmm. Vancouver is very nice. Mm -hmm. So in Montreal, do you have a favorite restaurant? 
or I favorite used to, cafe? Well, they have smoked meat there, right? They have, uh, and I always go back, when I go back and I have smoked meat. Uh, like we had a lot of delis in where I grew up, so I would always like that. Oh, that sounds... French fries. Yeah, I mean... A poutine. Yeah. Yeah, would you recommend that? Yeah, of course. People? Okay. Yeah, if you want your heart to stop and you... <laughs> Yeah, because what is it? You don't is like it, your body. Is it? Yeah. It's not curds, right? It's yeah, fries? it's cheese and oh, it fries cheese. and uh, gravy. Um, yeah, it's everything that's bad for you. <laughs> it's heaven. Yeah, it's heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I was wondering, what about Tim Hortons versus Dunkin' Donuts? Oh, uh, I... Or do you guys have Dunkin' Donuts? Does Toronto have Dunkin' we Donuts? We do, I think. But yeah, they're very loyal to Tim Hortons. I love Tim Hortons. And people love the coffee too. I don't and the coffee is very old school. It's like the two creams and two sugars, you know, that's the Yeah. F- there's yeah, comfort yeah. in that. I don't know what it is. I now because coffee has become like a big like Seattle and you yeah. can get really nice and good coffee that people are get snobby about coffee, but I think there's the that sort of like mom and dad old school drinking, you know, Two creams and two sugars. Two sugars, yeah. Well, when I was going to school there, one of my friends, he was like, that's how I started drinking coffee is because of Tim Hortons. He was like, he gave me a sip of his coffee and it tasted really good. And I and he's like, Colleen, you need to go to Tim Hortons and order a double double. <laughs> and to me, I thought that was like some sort of like, it sounded like ordering a burger. Yeah. And um, so I did. I ordered a double double in my life was changed i know right <laughs> yes yes i don't know Tim what Horton's it is so good yeah i remember my dad that's how my dad drank coffee mm. and then so i just grew up drinking that's how you drink coffee mm. now, i like the idea that they've they stay true to that idea yeah you know yeah so another thing when i was going to school there some a few of my canadian friends had told me that they could go. Oh, and in fact, one of my friends did. He went to Australia after we were finished with school because Canadians can have a six month work visa. That's right. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys have these perks. I know. I, I should know. go to Australia. I've never been. Do you, do you have like um, dual? I do. I or? became an American just uh, two years ago. It's now two years. Wow. I just thought, why not? And my daughter was born in New York, so she's an American. She has dual. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have one daughter that was born in Toronto, and Cindy's now down here okay. on a green card. What are your daughter's names? Esme, Esme. and Gemma. Esme and Gemma. Yeah. And Esme has decided she's going to go to school in the States. Yes, and she wants to write. She thought she was going to be an actress, but she, she took improv for a while and it decided she didn't want to do it. But she wants to be a journalist or want, wants to write. And then uh, Gemma wants to work in... Um, in marketing or in media. Is Cindy, is she still producing? No. She's, when she had kids and then it just worked out that I was working and I kept working, that she didn't have to and she just raised the kids. So Cool. Yeah. But what will she do now? The I don't know. The sky is the limit with I know. her. She sounds like a very talented yeah, woman. Yeah. I know. She's just going, ah, I'm getting too old. I don't want to do anything. She just wants to travel and hang out. and. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd really like to take the train Like you're talking about visiting Canada. I'd really like to take the train from like one end of the country to the other. And I'd also really like to go to the territories, like the upper. Yeah, I haven't been up there. That's the thing I kind of want to do. And in northern Manitoba, that's where they all go to see polar bears. So you can drive. Now everybody goes out and drives. And in Newfoundland, you can go and see icebergs just traveling by. That's the coolest thing. Really? Yeah, they're huge. You've seen? Yeah, they're huge. Wow. They're kind of wild. And they're just floating? Yeah, just floating. And then normally the ice comes in and, and sort of locks in the bay. Because if you're in a bay where mm-hmm. my dad was raised, the, all the ice would come in. And then just outside in the ocean, you see icebergs going by. I, d- I didn't know that we could experience icebergs. Like yeah, this that's far. cool. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's crazy to me how big Canada is. It's huge. It's so big. Yeah. And if you look at how Canadians live along the American border, there's not too many people that live up Mm-hmm. There's so much land mm-hmm. that they live close to the American border. That's where everybody lives. I don't know if this is the last question, but what do you think about the name Yukon for boy? I like it. Thank you. <laughs> Why, you've been pitching it? Yeah, I've yeah. been pitching it a lot. And um, only you and my friend and his wife said, yeah, we can see that. We can see, we can like hear that, that being yelled on the playground. Right. That's Yukon. what they said. Yeah, Yukon. 
Um, no, thanks for approving. <laughs> I had been wondering about that. My sister, she was like, no, no. I'm like that. It's a, it's a good name. Well, Norm, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and doing this. It's been fun. You you liked it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, that makes me happy. Uh, Congratulations with People of Earth. And you guys are almost finished with... We're almost... We're just editing the last three episodes. And um, yeah, they're just starting to air. So you saw last week was on, and then this week it's on again. And there's 10 of them. Mm -hmm. TBS.com. Yeah. You can watch the episodes there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say to the listener, beware of the person who comes to you saying, I don't know if you'll want to interview me. I've always thought of myself as boring. This is exactly what Norm said to me when I approached him to be on the show. And to you, Norm, I say, when I hear words like that, I instantly know I've landed on a gold mine. Congratulations to Norm and everyone who works on People of Earth. People of Earth is now in season two. You can check out the first season and second season on Amazon, or you can watch episodes on tbs.com. Playing underneath this is a track called Drawing the Blinds by the artist Home under the Midwest Collective. You can find more music by Home on bandcamp.com. The cover art for Mostly Minutia is by Eva Fan. You can find other musings by Eva, including paintings and illustrations at evafan.com. Lastly, Norm's favorite Kids in the Hall sketch that he did not write is called Dr. Seuss Bible, and his favorite sketch that he co-wrote with Kevin McDonald is called King of Empty Promises. Both sketches are available on YouTube, and both links are in the show notes, which you can find wherever you're currently listening to this episode. And for kicks, I threw in the link to the Dipping Areas sketch because we talked about it and because... I think it's hilarious. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded in my apartment in Glendale, California.